Verse 12, for before, okay, what happened before Paul blamed Peter? What's going on? That certain came from James. Okay, so there are some Jews that came from James' group. He did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they were come, see these Jews from Jerusalem, from James' group, they came. He withdrew and separated himself. Peter withdrew himself from the meal fearing them which were of the circumcision, because he feared what the Jews would think about him. So this is a perfect example of politics right here, of pastor church politics right here. So then we see that at verse 12, Simon Peter, he's fellowshipping with a bunch of Bible believers, so he's fellowshipping with the Gentiles here. And then what's going on is that all of a sudden, somebody comes to him and whispers at Peter's ear, hey, just to let you know, uh, this person who uh, came from Paul Chapel's church at West Coast Baptist College and Lancaster Baptist Church, they came to check you out. Why are you fellowshipping with a bunch of these Bible believers or these guys who are street preaching? And then Peter, because he's a pastor himself, protecting his prestige and reputation, he gets up and he gets scared what his fellow IFB pastors would think about him because he loved, because he likes Jack Chick, Peter S. Ruckman, other Bible-believing preachers, but then these IFB pastors check him out, and then so they play politics right here. They withdrew himself. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I can't fellowship with you guys, and then walks out. And then Paul, he gets upset about that. And you got to understand this. This is the perfect example of preachers today where they play politics because one thing that their their problem is at verse 12 when the Holy Spirit is moving and they're enjoying a church service they're enjoying fellowship all of a sudden their pastor buddies and their connections find out and then what do they do then they simmer down and water down the Holy Spirit right. they kill the spirit and they walk out of the service oh, oh I can't be a part of you anymore how about that how about that you, you know what's um interesting is that they might get on us Bible believers on separation, separation. But what's really funny about those guys is that when we come down to fellowship, those guys want to separate from us. Isn't that funny? Oh, I don't think they would. Okay, invite your Calvinist pastor to street preach with you. See how he responds. He'll withdraw himself. I thought we're all for uh, unity, unity. Let's do it together, brother. What happened? Look at that. See, the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of people. Here's the problem with people. They don't want to separate when they're told to separate by the Bible. They don't want to fellowship when they're told to fellowship by the Bible. Basically, they want to fellowship and separate on their own terms. That's the problem with people, period. You're ultra-separatist. You're ultra-separatist. Oh, I'm an ultra-separatist? All right, go out and witness to that person right there. There you go, buddy. Come street preach with me. Witness to that person. You rebel rouser. You're a divisive person. You split the church. You make us look bad. Okay, hold the sign with me, brother. <laughs> see, look, the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You know, they're afraid of how people see them. That's why they don't want a fellowship with you. You know why they accuse you of separation? Because how the world looks at you for separating. Worldly minded, politicians, not, not this pastor. You notice that. I don't care. People get on me. Oh, you know, you're too nitpicky, you know, about this one, that one, this one, that one. You know, you can get on me all you want on that one. But I know my group. I know where I stand because I'm responsible not for myself, but the church that I'm pastoring. Because I'm extremely... Uh, I am extremely responsible for the people that I'm pastoring. I can't involve anything wrong in it, no matter what. And then when we do something spiritual together in fellowship, then you get people who try to bring dissension right there. Oh, I don't like it when you guys run around the room. Oh, I don't like that kind of preaching. You could have preached better that way. You know, that was a little too mean. Look at this, man. Look at this. You just want to go whatever you guys want to do. That's it. Didn't we, uh, see, you know how you enjoy great fellowship? When you have proper separation, you're going to have proper fellowship. Mm -hmm. 
And when you have proper fellowship, you will have proper separation. All right, let's keep reading right here. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas... Okay, so the Jews were also dissembled with him. This was all chaotic right here. This was all disorganized. Insomuch that Barnabas also... So see, Barnabas, who was supposed to be with Paul, ministering to the Gentiles, was also carried away with their dissimulation. He was carried away by their dissimulation. In other words, hypocrisy, dissimulation, is another word for hypocrisy. We can see that in Romans chapter 12. If you want to turn over there, you can. So I'll read it real briefly right here. In Romans chapter 12, it also gives that same word. And then we see by context it has to do with hypocrisy right here. It has to do with hypocrisy. Uh, Romans chapter 12. And then, let's see right here. Uh, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. So when we have love for one another, there should be no hypocrisy in the midst. So we see right here that according to verse 12 and verse 13, Peter was fellowshipping with Gentiles, but he's carried away by the Jews and then, or politics, see? Your preacher friends, your connections. Oh, I'm afraid what they're going to think about me, blah, 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 blah. And then from verse 12 to 13, what we also notice right here is that Barnabas was also carried away. Barnabas and other people. Uh, I can never spell Barnabas right, but I'm going to spell according to the King James Bible. So it's, this is how you spell Barnabas in the King James Bible, okay? I'm just going to go by this, by the King James Bible. And then you also got other Jews, other people involved. And then because of this, that's why the fellowship, it was ruined and there was dissimulation. There was hypocrisy. And that's what you're going to get in preacher meetings. Oh, I love you, brother. Oh, I love you, sister. You get that in a regular church service. Oh, I love you, brother. Oh, I love you, sister. Just like Judas Iscariot. I love you, Lord. Let me kiss you on the cheek. <laughs> Crucify him. See? So that's the problem uh, with Christians nowadays, is that, oh, I love you, brother, oh, I love you, sister, and then that fake love, you know, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the earth. We all smile at each other, you know, stuff like that. And then it gets dissimulation when it comes out. So the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. And the Christian life, it should not contain hypocrisy. It should not contain hypocrisy. You understand this as believers that, of course, there are different levels. Uh, don't get me wrong. Sometimes there are different levels where in fellowship and separation, there are different levels on how you should treat the situation. So the, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get on that. That's a totally different teaching that I taught on fellowship and separation. There are different levels of fellowship, different levels of uh, separation. It's not like a one you separate from this guy, this guy you fellowship, this guy you separate this guy you fellowship. That's not how it works from the lesson that I taught to you. So there are different levels of how you have love. But nevertheless, it should not contain hypocrisy whatsoever. You can never lie about it. You got to understand this. Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot, he's a traitor. But do you think Jesus was a hypocrite with his love for Judas Iscariot? See, no. So that's why it's important to understand that within a fellowship with other believers, it doesn't matter if there are different levels of fellowship and separation. I mean, you got to understand this. Uh, IFB pastors, I don't, get, I don't get all cozy with them, but that don't mean that I hate them either. I do have genuine love for them, and I do attend some of their meetings, and I encourage all of them. I encourage all of them. I don't act like a hypocrite on that. But here's the thing is that despite of different levels of fellowship and separation, you cannot be a hypocrite in love and in fellowship. Never. That's not how it should be. People's got to realize we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like in the family. You have a brother and sister. There are some things that you're not cozy about, but that doesn't mean that you hate them either. See, you're honest in your love toward them. So that's how it should be likewise in the Christian family. Okay, let's keep reading right here. Verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So you'll notice right here that these people are not walking properly according to the gospel. 
Notice it says truth of the gospel, right? That's important to understand, truth of the gospel. So they're playing politics just like all the other Baptist preachers. What they do is when it comes to Bible-believing doctrine, they all play politics and they all lie about it and they don't walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Because why? They're going to lose their preacher connections, their politician buddies, etc. That's why it's not just getting on Baptist preachers. This is all preachers. That's why they get involved in the ecumenical movement. Yeah. That's why they compromise. Mm -hmm. Why are they compromised? Because the reason why is they're not walking uprightly to the truth. They prefer more of getting along with people rather than proclaiming what is true, standing for what is true. So because he did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what did Paul do? I said unto Peter before them all, so Paul said it in front of everybody. He like rebuked him. <laughs> if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, so because Peter is a Jew, but he's following with what the Gentiles did in eating and practicing with them, and not as do the Jews, he's not doing, doing the Jewish practices. He's observing the Gentile practices when he's fellowshipping with them. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Paul is asking, why are you compelled that you would try to have these Gentiles follow the Jewish practices when you were doing what we did before? I don't, you're going to get that. Sometimes there's these people who love Bible-believing preachers. They'll join you for street preaching. They'll join you at the revival meeting. And then they'll stab you behind the back about, yeah, those, uh, uh, those extremists. KJV only is, dispensationalist, blah, blah, blah. And then they backstab about you. And then I'm like, hey, you were fellowshipping with us earlier. I thought we were in the spirit. And then now you're going switching back to fundamentalist? What is this? There's no such thing as fundamentalist and Bible believer. It's Bible believer. It's either or. That's what, that's what you got to do. Don't play politics. This is in all the way. Not being a chameleon yeah. to fit whatever group, groupie that you want to be in. That's how it should be. We're going to see at verse 14, so Peter, he was rebuked before all. So there's your pope. He was rebuked in front of the whole church. So the whole church saw their pope rebuked. <laughs> wow, how about that? Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul practiced what he preached. Paul practiced what he preached. It is important that you got to understand this, is that we can't, you can't be tolerating all kinds of sinful activities in the church. You actually got to rebuke it. What's going to happen, Pastor, if you see two teenagers kissing in front of the doorstep? Oh, just let it slide. No, rebuke before all. Amen. This, we don't do that at our church here. Amen. Oh, and they're not And then they go back to their friends, their high school buddies. Oh, you, my mom dragged me to this church and the pastor actually rebuked me in front of everybody. Hey, man, I don't care, man. I don't care because you got to be rebuked before all if there's sin in the church. Now, of course, it's important to understand this. It's important to understand that sometimes there can be a misunderstanding. So according to Matthew chapter 18, it's important that you talk one-on-one -on -one with the person first. Otherwise, you're going to look like an idiot when you rebuke before all, and then there turns to be a total misunderstanding. Number two, it may not be a sin that affects the whole church. It's not like a blatant plain sin that negatively affects the whole church. We have people coming here who have no idea about the wrong kind of dressing. Sometimes we have, uh, I mean, when the women first come into our church, sometimes they got skirts like above the knees, and then guys, they have long hair, and they don't know. Remember Brother Chris? You know, I'm, I'm going to tease Brother Chris a bit. Remember him? He had that little uh, ponytail thing? And then when I was teaching and preaching, we didn't, you know, rebuke before all. We got a girl walking in our church. We do it like that with Brother Chris. Brother Chris, when he came in, we made him feel welcome, but then he got it through the teaching and preaching that, oh, I didn't know this was wrong, so should I cut it? And I had no idea. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah brother, you got to actually cut it. I didn't actually mean that. I didn't mean to point you out. I was actually, because you know me, I just preach and teach whatever the Holy Spirit leads yeah, me. Amen. And I go, oh, you know, like that. And then so Chris is like, okay. And then you know what he did? Came in all shortcut. Yep. That's what he did. So you see, you got to understand this. Some, you, there are things that you can't just say publicly before all. Yeah. Sometimes it takes time for the Holy Spirit to deal with their heart. Yeah. But man, if it's a sin 
that is a plain, blatant sin that negatively affects the church, then yeah, that has to be pointed out. All right. If someone's cussing in the middle of fellowship, you got to let them know. You know, I mean, you don't have to be rude, but you got to make sure that the person is properly rebuked before all that. Hey, you know, um, I don't know what you say in different churches, but in here, we actually don't do cussing over here at this church. We'd appreciate it if you can keep that closed like that. Amen. Mm -hmm. There are churches who are grow so big that they tolerate every sin in there. And when you walk inside a church service, you can't tell if you're in a college campus or in a holy house of God. Yeah. All right, that's why it's got to be properly rebuked. All right, let's return. Galatians, uh, oh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. We didn't read it yet. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin, what do you do? Rebuke before all. Why? That others also may fear. That's right. So it has to be rebuked, pointed out. That way people can see that and say, oh, so that's wrong. Well, I'm not going to mess up in that sense then. They're going to get it. Trust me, it'll be easier if you point out a person what's wrong, what he or she is doing. That way other people can get the memo and they don't do it. Look, if there is, let's say, for example, fornication in our church and the pastor clearly points that out and then rebukes that publicly before all, what do you think other people are going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, I'll be careful. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And then when uh, some brother or sister, you know, gets close to you, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's keep a distance here, all right? Let's, let's keep a distance here, all right? Because I saw what Pastor did. I saw what Pastor did. He's not messing around. Hey, you know what puts me in check? When I see other pastors mess up, and then pastors rebuke that before all, what do you think this pastor is going to do? Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm not going to do that, especially since I'm online. Yeah, they're all going to see me. See, that's why it's important that sin must be rebuked before all. That way other people don't mess up in the same manner. 